All right, hey everybody, P. Woods here from Boulder Climbing. We are uh, in the middle of our first week of community outreach that we're trying to do. I'm sitting here with Kyra Condi. Kyra, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, uh, you know, surviving right now. Yeah, hold up. Yeah, you know, kind of sticking around home a lot. I've been knitting, doing puzzles, you know, <laughs> really That's exciting stuff. Yeah, really exciting stuff. That's awesome. So you're originally from Minnesota and you are currently in Salt Lake. Yes. And, and how is the, I mean, we are currently in uncharted territory. We're in really strange times. How's the general mood sort of in the Salt Lake community with what's going on with the, with the coronavirus? Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone's been, you know, kind of dealing with it the same way everyone around the world has been. A lot of people building walls, hanging up hangboards, um, kind of being creative, making do with what we got, you know, and um, like I built a wall actually in my upstairs just the other day um, and nice. have a hangboard set up and stuff. So um, making it work, but it's not too bad, honestly. Like I, I, I love training and my, my actual day-to-day -day life hasn't actually changed that much. Uh, <laughs> shockingly, I, right. I, uh, like I usually stick around home and like cook and then go to the gym and now I just like, it's here instead of, you know, going somewhere. So um, that's basically the only change. So. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you're lucky, I guess, to have a setup where you could build a small wall. And I'm sure you already had a hangboard, like, you know, I can't imagine yeah, you living in a house without a hangboard. I, I didn't actually have one. I had, like, the little one that you can, like, hang on a tree when you go climbing outside. But uh, I actually had, um, like, Tension was able to get one to me, like, really fast. Um, so they, I got one of those and got the whole setup up within, like, you know, an hour after I got right. here. Um, and you yeah, settle in, you're like, all right, okay, whew, now I'm safe. I got it covered. Exactly. Now, now yeah. I feel okay about this. Like, I can definitely handle being home, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a time where hangboards have been sold out um, in North America. I know, it's crazy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the finger safety of everybody around the world right now. I want to tell people to be careful. You know? but, yeah, and you, and you make an interesting point because the, the number of people that are going to jump into I'm going to do hangboard and finger training because this is, I think, the only thing I can do in this really strange time. And I'm sure there's lots of forums and there's lots of places for advice, but um, we posted our first, like I did a bit of an intro, like this is what we're going to try and do at Boulder as we come through, uh, we're not going to do a bunch of training videos because there's so many things out there. And then I put a poll up and said, what do you guys want to see? And I probably 70% of the answers were, can you show us training at home? So I think your point is valid that a bunch of people are going to leap in. And normally what we tell people when they're trying to get into training is you need to be sort of at an established level of comfort before you start hanging on your fingertips. And it's really hard to judge that from somebody over email. Hey, am I ready to hangboard? I've been climbing for six months and I can climb V3. I'm like, I don't really know. Yeah, I've actually gotten that question a lot on Instagram. Like, oh, what workout should I be doing? I, and I'm like, honestly, my hangboard workout is absolutely not what you should be doing. Like, uh, and I don't really have a great workout for to like translate better to, you know, different level of climbers. Like my yeah. hangboard workout is, you know, very specific to what I do and what I want to get better at. and um, have been, you know, training my tendons for 10, 11, 12 years. So like, <laughs> it's, it's very different for somebody who started climbing like two years ago. Um, yeah. Like I can't even imagine a lot of, and if we're, everyone's looking to all the pro climbers they follow on Instagram and you could not have a worse role model of what hangboard workout you should do totally, than someone who's yeah. been training for 15 years. And to be fair, I have, I don't know. I didn't hangboard when I started climbing because, you know, young, young kids really shouldn't be hangboarding. So I didn't hangboard until I was like 16, 17 when I was fully grown. Um, and so like, I, I don't even know. And that's when I was climbing at, you know, a different level. And those would be the workouts that I would be doing if I was at that level now, but I, I didn't do them back then. So. Yeah. And I think you make a really good point and that's that it is up to almost the individual. So what is your, how strong are you? How are you built? Like we're all built differently. Some people have strong tendons. Some people don't. Some people develop hand strength very quickly and some people don't. So you're, your answers are always going to be, I don't know who knows you and I can suggest some kind of scaled in workouts, but it's definitely not going to be, you know, um, throw weight on your belt. And what we are covered with is all these professional climbers who are putting, you know, hundreds of pounds <laughs> and then hanging and going, this is how I'm staying strong during quarantine. And you're like, let me try that. And you're only going to pull your hangboard off the wall because you didn't put it up properly or you're going to yeah, pull your yeah. fingers out of your wrists. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you, how long have you been climbing for? When did you start climbing? I started like properly climbing when I was 11 years old and I'm now 23. So about 12 years, 12 and a half years. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I actually started at a birthday party at the gym. Like I went in with a friend from elementary school and I learned that there was a team and that's basically how I got started. Which is, I, I mean, I love that you're basically in the era of when there were, you know, you had climbing teams and there's a generation of people that were, climbing's cool. Um, I don't even know if there's a gym in my city. So yeah. you definitely came through a good era. Um, and that was your, did you go from like birthday party to team in the same year? Yeah, so I think I joined the team maybe like, maybe even that day, I don't really remember. Uh, but it was actually a time, like, so I, I joined the team, I think before I was 11. And I was super into doing musical theater at the time. And I think I got into a play when I like, I was on this team. And then as soon as I was in the play, like rehearsals were every night and I couldn't do climbing team and play rehearsal. And so I actually quit the team to do this play and uh, then found climbing again like a year later and was like, oh, I totally missed this. And then went back and then that's when I never stopped again. Yeah, that's, that's awesome that you like the, I think the, the interesting part about people's introduction to climbing and maybe it has to do with the longevity, lots of people come and go from climbing is how did you get introduced to it? Was it comfortable? Was it relaxed? You know, did you feel pressure? And if you had sort of a, a nice organic introduction to the sport and we're like, wait a minute, that was fun. Um, and you didn't feel any kind of pressure, then maybe it speaks to how, you know, you've been successful for such a long time. Um, yeah. I'm really glad of like when I started climbing, I think a lot of people start really young and, you know, I was, I was 11. I'd already tried a bunch of other sports. I didn't really like them that much. Didn't like the team sports. I knew I didn't like team sports, but I knew I was like athletic and liked sports in general. Um, but I hadn't found the one that really stuck yet. And I, I'm really, I think I found climbing at a really good time for that reason. And I actually like didn't start being like really, really competitive until a couple of years later. So. Yeah. So you had that, Oh my goodness, I think I found my thing. And I mean, I know my story is very similar. I did all kinds of sports through high school and university. I didn't start climbing until I was, you know, um, in third year university. And I went climbing outside with a friend and it was kind of terrible, but it was kind of awesome. And then I came back and I just started hunting. Like, how can I do more of this? And, I, and then I realized that the time it took, so I quit playing soccer and I quit playing. I just slowly, all the other sports just dropped off. Yeah. And went, Climbing is the thing. And if I'm going to put time into it, this is the thing I want to put time into. And, you know, the, it's about exposure and finding people that say, Hey, this speaks to me on some level. And you're either coming into the gym and saying that was fun. I might come back for another birthday party or just something just clicks in your brain and, and look, you know, here you are now. Totally. And I mean, I was climbing things no matter what growing up, you know, I was always on the wrong side of the playground on top of the roofs and like climbing the bottom part and like things like that and like up in trees and on top of my fridge and you know i i was meant to be climbing i just hadn't found it yet you know yeah that's awesome and <laughs> and you found it at a good enough time like you didn't find it when you were you know we, you'd already invested in something else or you'd already smashed a motorcycle up and you know what i mean like totally, you kind yeah. of have that you were you end up in the perfect storm and we have these so many ultra talented climbers that are competing right now that is the marriage of the right person with the right personality and then the right physical attributes that come together and you get, you know, people that podium and world cups and it's kind of awesome. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that is what's something really cool about climbing is it, it does take like a special type of person both to like it and then to be good at it. And then, you know, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, and, I, and I think there's a, this is the, this is what I'm interested in. This is, is getting into that, you know, what do you, this, the society around climbing and the, the how did you get here and uh, not, you know, I don't, we're not going to talk about your day-to-day -day training regime and because you, you do post about it. So people do see how hard you work and people are doing two a days and that kind of stuff. But I'm interested in this kind of story. Like, you know, the kid that was climbing on the wrong side of the playground and, and, you know, that was fun for you to go and find something that was different and dangerous. And I think the theme of not being interested in team sports is runs pretty solid to the climbing community too. And is it about like, if you had to pinpoint it, is it that you like being responsible for yourself or you, you know, like what is it about the difference between an individual and team sports? I think part of it for me is that I'm, I'm definitely a really competitive person, but I think it's, it's really self-competitive. So like, I don't, I don't feel outwardly super competitive with, you know, people who are around me. Um, and, and I think team sports really put you head to head with somebody else. And I'm so competitive that I don't really like being put in that situation. Um, and then also it's like, it's kind of like a shared glory thing. If you're on a team and you win, like everybody wins, right? Like it's not you who wins, it's everybody, mm -hmm. which is, is also really cool. But that didn't appeal to me as much. I really liked it being completely on me whether or not I win or lose. And like, 
you know, I, I wouldn't like the idea of, you know, if I'm in a soccer game, like I play the best I've ever played and the team still loses, you know, something like that would really bother me. And so I really like having it be completely my fault or my doing what if I win or lose. And so that's why team sports didn't really stick. But um, yeah, climbing in general, like I think uh, teaches you a lot of lessons like in that, in that aspect. So <laughs> Yeah, because, and I remember Alice and I talked about this and, and it kind of goes back to being like, how, how young do you start competing and what does that do for your competitive mindset? But you know, the person that you are now and knowing how competitive you are and um, you, you need to have a drive and a fire to be successful on a world level, no matter what sport you do. An individual sport, you wanna, you have to have a way to sort of compensate that if I didn't win or I didn't do well, and I know it's my fault, how do you go back and, and you know, how do you treat yourself the next day? Like, what does that cycle look like? And how do you manage that? Because, I mean, the, the highs bring lows. Yeah, I guess actually, I think I have a really good mindset when it comes to this. Like, I think kind of, you know, people have like their superpower in climbing. Some people, you know, work really hard. Some people are really talented. Some people have like a crazy good mental game. Like some people are really good at seeing beta. And I think one of my things is that I have like a really positive relationship with climbing and my, um, like, I guess my ability and how I do at competitions and stuff. So, you know, I like to be proud of the work that I put into a competition. So if I go into a competition and feel like I could have trained harder, that's this feeling that I don't like. So like, I won't feel as um, happy, I guess, if I win that competition and feel like I didn't put in the work that I should have. Um, and I won't, and I'll be upset at myself if I go into a competition and feel like I didn't work hard enough to do it. And that's the only time really that I'm upset is if it's my fault that I, you know, like that I didn't do enough work to do it. So I guess I, a better way of saying that is like, when I go into a competition, I wanna know that I'm proud of the work I put in no matter what the result is. Right. So even if I come in last, which I hope would not happen. <laughs> Has that up. never happened? Have you never come in last? I've come in last at like in finals and stuff for sure. Um, but not like last. And I, uh, I think I started too young really to ever get like last. <laughs> last. But yeah. Um, but like, you know, I want to be happy with where I, how hard I worked to get there. And, you know, then that's the satisfaction that I get. I, I know that I put the work in and then I can at least be proud of that. And then I hope that the result comes with it, you know. That's really, I mean, it's awesome to hear that, that, that you've built up that, um, that personal accountability and that you're okay with dealing with it. Because I think that I mean, from the times that I've met you and the times that we've hung out a little bit and, and seen the kind of personality that you portray, like through your social media, which I think is truly you, um, it, it struck me right away that you have a really sort of infectious, positive attitude about climbing for being someone that's so competitive. And I think not everybody finds that balance where some people, and I was one of those people that super competitive, but angry competitive. Um, yeah. I, you know, I kick chop bags a lot and I've, you know, I've had those meltdowns in comps because of performance level and the, the ability to strip out how did I do versus how did I come to this is, uh, it's hard to do. So I think it's awesome that you're, personality is you know so positive and so upbeat and yet so competitive and I mean it shows you are an excellent climber and I don't think I've ever seen you in competition also not look like you were pretty much having a good time <laughs> yeah I think a lot of people um end up you know really wrapping their self-worth within climbing so you know if they're having a great day they feel amazing they feel like they're on top of the world they feel like a stud um and then you know the other then the days like where things are going badly, it's like, I'm a terrible person. I shouldn't be climbing. Why do I do this? You know, like then like I see that in a lot of people, um, even really, really good climbers. And, you know, part of that is, you know, that drive that makes you work hard. Um, but I think it's also really important to keep that separation. And I think that's something I'm really good at. Um, just in general, it's like, if I'm having a bad day, I'm like, yep, this makes sense. I'm tired. <laughs> or, you know, like I need to drink more water or something, you know, right. um, I think it's just like maybe like a logic type thing. Uh, but I think it's it's something that's hard to do, and uh, it's something that I think a lot of people could benefit from is just remembering that you know if you're having a bad day climbing, it doesn't matter. Like in the long in the grand scheme of things, if you're working hard and you're you know putting that effort in, like that's really what's going to matter in the long term. And if you can be proud of that, then you can be proud of however you're climbing. So along that same vein, do you like do you practice any type of mental training, like focus, any type of self-awareness do you practice any type of mindfulness like is there anything in there where you have to remind yourself that this is how i approach this sport and do you, i mean you must i mean 
everyone gets into a funk every now and then. Um, is it something you're active in or does it, is it just sort of part of who you are? Um, I think as far as like, you know, what I was just talking about, that's part of just who I am, I guess. Um, but I did start actually talking to a sports psychologist recently, just because, you know, with Connie being the Olympics, we now have resources through the United States Olympic committee. Um, so I've been working with this sports psychiatrist who's there and she's awesome. Like she totally changed my game. I didn't realize how much I could have benefited from this. Like, cause I always like, didn't really believe in mental coaching, didn't really think about it. But I think a lot of times, like I'd never talked to like a professional, you know, sports psychologist. It's a very different way of like, than just um, mental coaching, you know? And uh, that really, really helped me this year. I, I think I would have been freaking out at Toulouse, like the qualification event where I qualified if I had not talked to this lady. Like I, like, I would have been a complete mess. I already was a mess. I didn't sleep for a week leading up for that competition. Like we got to France and I did not sleep until that got pretty much. And then I was too excited the night I qualified and couldn't sleep still. So, like, <laughs> so the roller coaster was like, yeah. Yeah, like I straight up could not sleep. And I, I messaged her about that and she helped a little bit, you know, like, um, but like I completely changed how I approached comps mentally, basically. And, you know, just things like even, like in a lead comp, if you do qualifiers, you have your first qualifier and then you usually have like an hour and a half break and then you have your second qualifier. And I kept doing well on one qualifier and terrible on the other qualifier for like the first half of the league comp season, like of the lead season this year. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And part of it, when I was talking to her, she's like, well, you're kind of an introvert. You maybe want to not talk to people in that hour and a half. Because what I would normally do is you have this hour and a half in between your qualifiers, you talk to your coaches, you talk to the like, competitors, you, you know, kind of walk around, wander around um, and try and get into the zone. But like, you can't really when you're doing that. And so it's so busy. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, you're, you're wasting energy when you're doing that. Um, so maybe just try not to put headphones in, like focus on the route, know exactly, like know everything that you need to know about that climb. And then um, when you get on the climb, it's almost like you've done it before. And so like things like that, like I, I never really thought of. Uh, that that really changed how I approached climbing in comps, especially. That's awesome, and you've like you just sort of given me any one of three different segues, and and I think it's interesting um, because I don't know that enough people. I mean, people definitely don't have the resource to have a sports psychologist on hand, so that's something that's not um, super obvious. But it's something to consider, even people that are coaching. Uh, and I would say, especially in that the youth athletes, is that it's something to pay a, a little more attention to maybe is that the psychology is not as simple as, you know, try harder or, you know, pick yourself up next time. It can't just be these little one off statements. Sports psychology and understanding performance psychology is it's a really, you know, it's a cornerstone of serious professional athletes. And it's great that um that you got exposure to it. I know a few other people, I know the Canadian team gets exposure to it. I'm sure lots of, you know, the, the European teams are, are in the same way. And when you're talking about such small margins of victory and error, um, why not put every tool in the bag? You know, and it's right. awesome that you, that that's something that you wouldn't have thought you needed until you got a chance to try it. And then you're like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And you know, one of the biggest things we talked about actually was like this present focus, because I'm kind of a I don't know, hyperactive person. And so like my brain's- I don't see it. I don't see it at all. And I'm, my brain's always no. going like a thousand miles an hour. You're super calm. Yeah, especially lead climbing because I'm a fast climber in general. And I like would like shake myself off the wall sometimes, you know, or like, you know, it's just kind of just like too wild. And I'd be thinking like six moves ahead and like be approaching the crux move that I had seen on the, um, from other climbers where they fell and stuff. And I'd be thinking about that move when I was 10 moves below it. And then I'd make a mistake there and I'd fall below where I should. And so something we talked a lot about was this present focus where like, you don't need to think about that crux until you get there. Like you need to focus on executing exactly what you're doing right now. And then if you get to a rest or somewhere where you can like calm yourself and then think ahead, then you can, you know, cause, but that's your present focus is I'm resting. I can think ahead. And then you can focus again on what you're doing. And like, which that is like another level again from present focus, which is today or this climb. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking this move. Yeah, it's, it's like, so I focused way more on like learning everything about the climb, knowing that I knew it, just like not actively thinking about it. And then um, on the climb itself, just thinking about the move I'm doing and nothing else, which is easier, easier said than done. <laughs> Absolutely. Because people sort of, I think people are going to watch this and be like, obviously, I think about the move I'm doing while I'm doing it. And you're like, no, you'd be surprised how many people, if you really force them to think about it, even if they go back to their project outside of the project in the gym, 
get excited, their heart rate starts to go up as soon as they get into that lead in sequence. They're like, oh my God, this is the hard part. And their hands start sweating and then you blow and you're like, wow, man, why did I fall below the crux? Because you weren't thinking about it. You weren't thinking about the moves you were doing. Yeah, I didn't really realize this about myself until I had talked to a couple other people about what they think when they're on the climb. And, uh, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I'm like, just kind of, you know, thinking about climbing. And I was like, man, I'm going like, this one's bad. Oh man, I have to go to the left hand with the next one. Oh, the cup's over there. And then I need to match. And then, oh God, this one's not as good as I thought it was going to be. And like, <laughs> like that's how bad. Like everything. endless monologue. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, maybe I should change something about that. So, um, yeah. So as, so to answer the original question, yeah, I, uh, have focused on that kind of that mental aspect of climbing a lot more. And that's something that I completely changed in the last half year. That's pretty cool. And would you, I mean, experience is definitely something I, I think you shouldn't discount experience. And I think that um, you get a lot of that. If I knew then what I know now, people would sort of say, oh, I would do everything differently. And I think your experiences build you. So early success, early failure, frustrations, whatever that is. But if you had to sort of tell, you know, 14 year old Kyra something, um, what would you tell her? Uh, I get that question a lot, actually, shockingly. Um... The, we'll edit it out then. Never mind. I don't want to ask the question everybody no, no, asks. No, no, but it's, it's something I, it's obviously something people want to know about. And uh, the one I've decided on is that hard work pays off, I guess. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of what pe the other question I've been getting a lot is like, what does making the Olympics mean to you? And it's the same, it's the same answer. It's like hard work pays off. And I think it's really easy to get like stuck in the mindset, like, oh, like this isn't working. It's not, I'm not doing enough, or maybe you think that you are doing enough, but it's not going to matter, you know? And I think right. if you stay positive and, you know, know that it will eventually matter, like that, that's really helpful. That's awesome. And, I, and I, it is, that's one of those, oh, well, that's going to seem obvious too, but people forget. And I had a, a strength coach who was um, an Olympian and he was, knew how to deal with like high stress and high value environments. And he was a huge proponent of saying you need to do the work for the goal that you want to achieve. There are no shortcuts and doing the work is not as easy as you think. And the person that goes to the gym on the day they don't want to versus the person that doesn't go to the gym on the day they don't want to, as that builds up over time, that person is going to beat you because yeah. they went on in the bad mood, in the rain, whatever it is, they put in some kind of workout. Oh, I hurt my finger. Okay, are you doing something else? Yeah, exactly. A week off. Oh, are you lifting other weights? So what, you know, the work is every, it's all encompassing. Totally, yeah, and I actually, I've said it a lot too, like I'm really glad that I wasn't, you know, somebody who found success in climbing right away. Like I was good, definitely, and, and decently talented, but I wasn't, naturally the best at climbing you know i had to work for it and i think that really teaches you like how to work hard basically uh, which is yeah because you work to get there you didn't you weren't naturally good and then you get dethroned from it and then you have to have sort of shake your head and and come back and realize that it doesn't just get handed to you and people come up and catch up and they're better than you if you're always the one who's like you know there's something to this and i'm going to get better then you know you really do that you know as you say you learn the value and um I don't think it's obvious. I think people will say it's obvious that obviously hard work has value, but until you make people say it out loud or look inward and really believe it, that's a different story. Totally. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that I would say that a lot of people uh, look up to you, um, younger climbers, older climbers, new competitors, all that kind of stuff, because I think you do have such a, you have such a good social media presence and you're, you are interactive. And I think that gives you this platform. Um, who did you look up to when you started climbing? You realized climbing was a thing. Did you have a hero? Did you have a, I want to be like that one day? I'm, I'm thinking, I definitely loved Chris Sharma. I, <laughs> like everybody does. Hey, we all did. We all did. I saw, I saw King Lions and was like sick. Um, but I think probably the biggest one is Alex Johnson. She started climbing at the same gym that I started climbing at. And so when I was 11 and just starting climbing, she was 19 and was winning World Cups. So I saw her and was like, I want to do that, you know? And so it's, this last year was actually really cool for me because I've always known her and um, uh, we've always been friends, but I was always, you know, that kind of 11 year old kid. And then this year was like, the <laughs> finally got to become like actual really good friends. And, you know, now she's like a super close friend of mine. So I think that's really cool. And, um, and something that's actually really unique about the competition climbing experience. Like I was just talking to Sean McCall about this yesterday or something actually about how it's really cool, how different world cup climbers who are now competing together 
have like looked up to each other like in the, the past. So like Futaba, for example, was like a really big fan of Akio. Like there's a picture of like really baby Futaba. Oh yeah, when she was like eight or something. Yeah, and like, you know, now they're competing with each other. And um, like, same thing, like I remember talking about Sean McCall and Jakob Hubert when I was like 11 on team, you know, and watching the World Cups. And, um, you know, now I, I compete at the same comps as them. It's, it's just a really cool community for that reason. Agreed. And yeah, and it's where, I think we're in a really interesting time where um, the, the, we're getting to the last of that old guard almost of World Cup competitors and, and Sean sort of the last leg of those where he came out of the juniors and, you know, winning junior world championships, just as climbing was swinging into being more popular. Um, and the, his longevity has been pretty amazing. So, you know, there's a reason that you got to look up to him and now you climb with him is that he, I mean, he's been putting that work in, you know, for a long time. I mean, you look at, you know, your average World Cup podium is in the early 20s. All of a sudden, 30 is pretty old. Um, so it's, longevity is hard in, in a sport like climbing. And it's, uh, it's awesome that you get to climb with the people that you looked up to because that could have easily just gone, you know, to, hey, that was, you know, you could have been a generation out. But totally. how cool yeah. is it with the train with, you know, someone that you looked at and went, that's who I want to be like. Yeah, it's really cool. And, you know, I geek out about it every once in a while. So <laughs> still. When, why not, right? Yeah. yeah and exactly. she's a, I mean, she's an ex, the comeback from Alex in the last, you know, season and a half is pretty awesome too. So you've got to been, I mean, you get to be a part of that training curve and that's got to be some drive. Totally. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's also just a really cool thing about being here in Salt Lake now um, is like, I actually have people to train with, which I always trained alone in Minnesota. Like I didn't really have a coach since I was like 16, 15 or 16. And uh, so I trained basically myself and I went to training camps whenever I could to get experience with coaches and stuff um, since then. And so to be here and be surrounded by people who are motivated and um, can help motivate me is just like completely different. Cause I'm always used to providing all of that motivation for myself. And so now to have kind of extra energy in a way um, cause I'm not solely having to motivate myself. There's people around me who are also giving me that energy uh, that's, that's been a really big change. Yeah. Because there is, especially, you know, if, if for someone that is a bit introverted, if you're being called on to provide all of the psych all of the time, then it's, it is draining. You are like, all right, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm the best climber I know. So I guess I'll give myself advice today. Yeah. Well, it's, it was kind of nice, at least in, in Minnesota, I had like the gym to myself always. So, cause it was a private gym. So I would just go in and, you know, do my thing. Uh, but it's, and I wasn't sure even if I liked climbing with other people anymore, almost. And so then I, <laughs> Maybe they should test this out a bit. I, so I did. And then I moved here and it's been, it's been awesome. Like to have so many motivated people around has been like a game changer for sure. And also to have coaches. I've, like, like I said, I hadn't really had coaches and especially ones who really cared about competitions or, you know, that cared about the same things I cared about um, since I was really little. So to have people like Josh and Meg, who are our US team coaches here has been absolutely game changing. Like Josh is an amazing setter and amazing, like, just coach in, in general and a good support person. And so to have somebody who's in my corner has just been awesome and really game changing. Yeah, that's really cool. And I mean, it's, it's great that USA climbing has sort of created that environment and said, Hey, you know, come and, and be in the same place because that's how you're going to get better. We can make you better. Yeah, totally. None of us really thought that anyone was actually going to move here. Like they were like, okay, we're going to make our base in Salt Lake city um, and people will move here. And everyone was like, I mean, maybe two people, you know, and now a bunch of us are here and it's, it's a really cool energy. That's like, um, really infectious and it's, it's pretty dope. Yeah. Like, would you ever have thought that you were going to move cities for climbing? No. You travel for comps, of course, but you're like, yeah, my home base, my home gym is great, but um, really I'm going to move because that's, and, but that's, I mean, that's every other professional sport. Totally. Yeah. I mean, good is because all the talent's in the same place. And so are the coaches and you don't see them twice a year. You see them every week. Yeah. And that's, been, that's been a huge, huge change for me. That's like a really good change for sure. That's really cool. Um, I wanted to ask you, I know that you posted about it, but I don't know that everybody knows like the, the long history. You have overcome. It was a condition, I guess. It's a condition. <laughs> so I know that, I mean, I think it's amazing. I think that like knowing what I know about the, the way you compete and what you came through, I think it's really, really inspiring. I think it's awesome. And I think that the people that are going to watch this, um, what we're, you know, as I said, we're trying to build, it's more than just, you know, uh, what podiums are you on and how hard you train and the training conversation is super interesting, but I think that this is, you've got this, you know, chapter that you can look back on and say, man, I did a thing. 
Yeah, you know, it's definitely something I'm really proud about. And it's it's come a lot more into the spotlight recently, which has been kind of interesting for me. Because uh, I used to only post about it, you know, once a year is my back surgery on the day that I got the surgery. Right. Um, and so now, like, you know, have everybody talking about it. It's been kind of funny to me because <laughs> it's like, well, this has been something I've been dealing with for, you know, 12 years. So or not You're fairly years. used to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so basically what it is is I got diagnosed with idiopathic scoliosis when I was 12 years old. So only about a year after I'd found climbing. Um, and I'm actually really glad that it happened when it did, because I was kind of in that phase of life when I was on the team, it was meeting twice a week, but I was also in middle school and wanted to go hang out at the playground with my friends. Um, and I didn't really want to go to practice, you know, so I kind of kept asking my parents, Oh, can I skip practice tonight? I want to go hang out with this person. Um, and you know, like my priorities were elsewhere. And then this back surgery came and, uh, the first doctor I went to basically was like, Oh, climbing doesn't matter. Like you'll have a family one day. You won't, you won't worry about sports. Uh, and that was, that did not sit well with me at all. I stopped. Looking. I can't even imagine. I, I can't even leave a 12 year. You'd be like, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah. And, and you know, that was at the Mayo clinic, which is like the renowned hospital in, it happens to be in Minnesota. And so my parents really wanted me to go there. And I was like, I'm not going to that doctor. No way. Um, and so we found a different doctor and he, you know, told me to send him a picture when I was on top of the podium and was like, you'll be climbing back in no time. You only need a four month recovery. You're an athletic kid, there's no way that you would need nine months, which is what the other, other doctor had told me. Um, and then we got a third opinion just to make sure that the second doctor wasn't just crazy. Wasn't selling crazy. you the other line. Yeah, you know, cause like we had like nine months, we had four months and then, uh, so we went to another guy and he said, yeah, four or five months would be fine. Um, and so I ended up going with that second surgeon uh, at Gillette Children's Hospital, which is happened to be like 15 minutes away from where my parents still live. Um, and that's what really made me realize how much climbing meant to me because I got it taken away in this time when I wasn't sure how much I liked it or I, I loved it already, but I wasn't sure where my priorities were. And so they have it taken away at that time was huge for me because I knew that I wanted to go back and I knew how much I wanted it. Um, and so then as soon as I was like, you know, four months out of back surgery, I was straight back into the gym. I actually went to this like training camp and just, I remember having flappers on every single spot on my hand because we were climbing up this like lead gym that was super tall and I had all jugs and all I could do was like 5'10". Um, but yeah, it, it like jump started me back into it. And, and then it wasn't until after that back surgery that I actually like won youth nationals for the first time. Which is, I mean, it's kind of amazing because this is not, um, I broke my leg or I had ACL surgery, which is you generally sort of, you tear your ACL, you know, you take an unfortunately long amount of time off, but you come back, zero difference. Yeah. Um, this is not zero difference. You know, it's, it's pretty significant. And if, if, you know, people who are watching this, if you haven't seen like Kyra posted these pictures of the x-ray and it's, I mean, it's kind of amazing. And, and I know you've said every now and then that there's a boulder where you just don't quite fit and you have to sort of spin your brain around how do I do this in a way that I, I'm actually, my mobility will let me get in there. But this is not like, come out of surgery, wait a few months, hit the gym, do some weights. And then it's like, it never happened. Like you are like, you notice. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. Cause at this point, I, I don't remember what it feels like to be able to move your back, <laughs> I guess. Um, so to you me, wait till you hear about 45 and you'll be like, yeah, I don't know. I still don't remember. Yeah. It, it's my normal, you know? So, um, and it, it, I didn't actually, I think I didn't notice it for a really long time. Like I, I, after my back surgery, like when I got, got back into climbing, I didn't really notice it. Um, so, cause I have 10 vertebrae fused. I guess I never mentioned that. In so yeah, T2 yeah. through T12 are all fused together. So essentially they're one bone. Um, what they do is they basically break all those bones and put bone in between and then it heals as one bone. So it's just a solid structure in there. Super chill, and, yeah. Yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, when I was, you know, at a certain level of climbing, I never noticed it because you didn't really have to move that section of your back. There was like some sideways dinos where I maybe noticed that I was really bad at holding the swing because my whole back would move as one. <laughs> like, this yeah. is the no. Like, tear me off the wall. And um, if, if you watch like a Kyo climb or um, Yanya climb, they do this thing where they like scorpion and they can take all the momentum with their leg and like their lower back um, and like then hold their upper body in the same spot. And so for me, I kind of have to have my whole body go as one. Otherwise, like I'm off. Um, but yeah, and I didn't actually start noticing things like that until I was into these like more advanced moves, like crazier, weirder moves. So like when I started climbing harder outside and harder in competitions, that's when I started noticing where um, my back would get in the way. And it actually was really frustrating because kind of like what I was saying is like what I enjoy about climbing is being able to give it my all kind of and, and be proud that I gave it my all. 
And on moves like that, I just get so stuck. And it's like, I can't give it my all because I'm so stuck. And so that was, that's when I get frustrated really is, is when I feel like I can't um, do everything I can to be able to do a move. And it's like, I'm, there's something that is stopping me from being able to do this. That is not my fault and I can't do anything about it. Um, but I got better with that mindset and have started just trying to get creative and not get stuck in the mindset that I can't do this because of my back. So, yeah, but you, for someone that, like, as you said earlier, where your approach has always been, Hey, as long as I've done everything I can to be actually to pinpoint and say, it's actually not my fault. Um, that's gotta be a, you gotta, you gotta somehow solve that where you're like, that's not normally me. Normally I take all the responsibility, but you have to give yourself this corner where it's, man, every now and then, and I know like people think, oh, they're reaching problems or like, you know, that sort of thing. But this is like next level. As soon as you get international, you don't think reachy. You don't think, oh, that's not a fair move. You just think, hey, we're all in the same boat here. And then you get to say, yeah, but every now and then I'm in that boat over there. And mm. yeah, totally. you, it doesn't show like you don't show that frustration. Yeah, I, I've tried to get better about it, especially because, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. And I have tried to find my ways around the moves that I particularly have difficulty with. Like um, there's like this move where you end up having to press into like a volume or a big hold and you have to arch your back and get your hips really close to the wall. And then you sometimes have to like shuffle across it or, you know, reach up. And that move is so hard for me because the only spot that I can arch my back is the bottom, like, you know, in my <laughs> lumbar spine. And uh, so like, it's just, it's painful a lot of times. Like it just hurts my lower back because I'm bending so much in that one spot. Um, and I just have to realize that it's going to hurt, but it's, I can still do it sometimes. And it's not like I'm hurting myself. Like it's not going to be injured. It just kind of hurts. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. And you're like, yeah. all right, I have to go through a thing right now yeah. because root setters seem to like pressing. Exactly. So on I'm better at realizing that it's painful, but I'm not getting injured, you know, and that you can push through that. That's it's something that's fine to push through. Um, but like finding that line of what, when you can push through and things like that. And, but I've also just been working on weaknesses that can help me like kind of power through the, like the weird moves occasionally, you know, like if you can just, you know, pull through instead of doing some weird back shit, then. <laughs> yeah. There's sometimes there's always another way, right? You're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something a little bit different here. Yeah. And that's what I've learned. And so um, to try and find those methods and, and not get frustrated about being able to do it, you know, the easier way. Um, just finding the method, the method that's easier for me. So finding like, that's your right way. Right? Exactly. You know, just, we, we know that that's part of climbing is root setting and everyone's going to come across and they're like, Oh, I need to do this. Like there's a, you know, I'm not good at that or I'm not good at this. And you, you do. And if you have that resilience and you have that, that fire and you says, Hey man, as long as I put every single bit of effort into this move in a way that I know that I can, and I'll just, the cards will fall where the cards fall. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I do, I think it's really cool that you get to, um, you, you've got this in your personality that you're driven and then you got tested super early and then you were like, yeah, no, I, I love this thing and it's not going to come away. And then I'm going to put the work in and I'm still going to put the work in. It's like, you're sort of, your climbing arc has this, I love what I'm doing and I work hard and, um, you know, there's a classic phrase is like, Oh, you either have the, you know, you have the talent or you have the work. And when you have both, you get somebody that gets to go to the Olympics. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's super cool. And uh, I do, and I want to, because I think this is awesome. And I know you caught a little bit of flack for it. Um, not that long ago on Instagram, but you have a tattoo <laughs> that I, because of it, it speaks to my personality because I'm a little bit dark black humor and I'm a little bit cynical and I think it's awesome. And I know that you posted and then you posted this follow up. It's like people just didn't get it. I mean, just tell us, just tell us what it is and why. Yeah, I guess I could, I could show it. I'm wearing shorts right now. Uh, but it says, you suck, try harder. Um, and it, it has a lot of meaning to me, actually. It's, it's kind of funny because I am a really positive person, which, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, this is negative self-talk. Like, that's not good. You shouldn't promote that. Um, but for me, that's, that's not what it means at all. Like, for me, it kind of means like, you know, never be satisfied. It's you, you need to always keep working hard. Um, and it, it also for me is a big tie back to where I started climbing. Um, so the gym I started climbing at was vertical endeavors and we had this area up there that's called B2. It's like bouldering cave two. And it's a really steep wall. It's 45 degrees goes into 60 degrees overhanging. And it's like, that's the wall that made me the climber that I am. Like, mm -hmm. that's why I'm strong. Um, and somebody wrote that on the wall there. Um, so it said, you suck, try harder, just like really small and Sharpie on the wall. Um, and all of us loved it, you know? 
Cause like, yeah, you gotta try harder. Like, it's like, you kind of don't want to be going around being like, I'm the best. I'm like, I deserve to be here. You know, I'm the best. I I'm going to stay here. You know, like that's not the right attitude in my opinion. Like you kind of want to have that, like, all right, like I need to keep going. Like, this isn't enough. I want to like not be satisfied. And a hundred percent reality check, right? Like you're yeah. someone else is always waiting for you to make the one mistake or not try hard and be like, yeah, today I beat you because you know what? You didn't bring it. Definitely. And it's not like, I think I suck. I, I definitely don't, you know, it's, it's kind of more like, uh, yeah. Like remember your roots, like be humble. Don't, um, don't ever be satisfied. It's kind of what it means to me. And then it's also this tie back to where I started climbing. It's a tie back to Minnesota. Then we wrote it really big in the wall that we all built together. So then there's this wall called the A um, in Minneapolis, which like I helped build it. And that's where this is written again. Um, yeah, it has a, a lot of other random meanings to me as well. It, um, when I got the tattoo is meaningful to me. Like there's a lot. And then it's also facing me. So um, it's written upside down if you were to just look at me. But it's like I can read it upside right. And so um, when I told my mom I got it, she wasn't the happiest. I had told her I was planning on it. And she was like, oh, you don't want that written on you. Like, and I was like, but I kind of do, mom. I, I, <laughs> I kind of do. I kind of do. And I don't want to have to write out the story you just told us. I'm like, that's a paragraph or two. Like, exactly. like, that would be a lot of writing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't make a great tattoo. Um, but so when I told my mom I got it, um, it was actually after the Hachi OG World Championships um, when I was like, I realized just, just how much I wanted to make it to the Olympics, basically. Um, and I was like, I am doing the right things. It's going to happen. And I like had to remind myself that. And so I got the tattoo then. I had already been thinking about it for a while. Um, and so it's like, yeah, it was a kind of reminder. And so I told mom when I got it, like I, I told my parents that I got it and they were like, oh, Kyra, like, ah. Uh. And I was like, but mom, I'm going to get the Olympic rings underneath it. Like, just wait. Right. You and just was, wait and see. Uh, and she, that made her, cause she like really wanted me to believe in myself that I was going to be able to make it and stuff. And they're awesome. My parents like very supportive and not pushy. It's, it's amazing. It's like a really hard combo, I think. Um, I think you're right. I think it's a very difficult combo, especially in an individual sport where you've totally. got parents that are, they see your talent and they're like, oh my God, how hard do we push her? Yeah, they, they've been amazing and in, in not pushing me, but like believing in me. And uh, they really wanted me to believe in myself and being able to make it because like they knew that I could do it, which is, I think, really cute. Um, and so when I told them that, they were like, cool. Okay, yeah, we're fine with the tattoo. <laughs> yeah, they get a little bit of like, oh, wait a minute. We're All actually right, talking right. about our daughter being in the Olympics. Yeah, I, okay. guess, I guess if you get the Olympic rings underneath it, that makes sense. So That makes it all right. That's still my plan. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the Olympics because I mean, we are, this, we are in crazy times. The Olympics has been postponed for a year. Everybody keeps their um, qualification. Yes. So you, is an extra year of training a good thing or a, is that too much? I'm honestly kind of psyched. Yeah. I, I feel like um, it was almost like getting into like too much crunch time, you know, right now, like, you know, I was gonna, you know, work my ass off until the Olympics and, you know, hope that it paid off. Um, but now I can like almost go into it even, even more of a strategy and, um, you know, have even more time to prepare and I'm definitely going to take advantage of that, um, and try to represent the U S as best as I can and, um, represent myself as best as I can. And, um, like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about it. Like I obviously am disappointed that it couldn't happen this, this summer. Cause I was super looking forward to it, but I'm just so glad that it's not canceled that, um, like, I don't care when it happens as long as it happens. So, right. Kind of how I um, and I, I think it's amazing. I mean, and. I know that there's lots of people that talk lots of things about climbing the Olympics, not the Olympics, and we're not going to go there. I, you know, that could be hours worth of debate. Um, but I think it's cool that climbers that see that and want to be a part of it, get to be a part of what most people think is the epitome of competitive sport is the best of the best coming together and climbing the Olympics. Um, so, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. I was originally, you know, full disclosure, I was a detractor. I was like, we don't need the Olympics. Like, we don't need a combined format. But the more climbers I've talked to um, who are excited about it and who have been like, guess what? I'm speed climbing. That's going to be fun. Um, I've gotten a bit, I'm excited about it. I think it's really cool. And, and I do think it's awesome. And you, I know you obviously put on USA jersey before, but there's, is, do you think it's going to be a different feeling like climbing in a world cup for your country and the Olympics? Is there going to be like, is that an emotional step up or is the, the flag on the back, the flag on the back? Um, no, I think, it, I think it'll be a really different thing. Um, I, I like haven't interacted with other sports that much. Like I love the Olympics. I've always been a huge fan. I've always watched it. I've always watched the trials leading up to it. Um, and I mean, to be on the same stage as those athletes who I've looked up to as like, you know, people pushing their sport, 
um, I think that's that's going to be really cool. Like that's the part that I'm looking forward to the most. Is being in that arena and being around and just being like, oh my goodness. Yeah, like being surrounded by tons of athletes who I know have put in like just so much work into, you know, the thing that they're passionate about and like being surrounded by that type of passion and, um, you know, people who have done the same things I have, you know, I think that's, I think that's really cool. And I, that's what I'm definitely the most excited about. Yeah. And I think it's, I, I mean, I wish you all the best on that. I think it's going to be amazing. I know it's a little bit in the future, but people are not going to lose track and we're going to, they're going to come back to it. Um, I honestly, like, I feel like I could talk to you for an hour. Um, like this you're it's super easy. And I think you're a really interesting person and a super interesting climber and you've had tons of success. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of conscious of the fact that we're going to post these on Instagram and I don't, I want to make sure people watch them. Yeah. Um, is there, I just want to give you that. Is there like, what do you want people to know about you that you maybe doesn't come across in your Instagram and in your, I think you have to scroll like a hundred miles to find a non climbing picture, but and oh you're a Minnesota God. kid. Like, did you play hockey? Like, you know, what's something that like, Oh man, that's a hard one. There's not a ton about me. Let's see. Okay. I, I can play the flute. That's a big one that a lot of people don't know. Um, I love singing. Um, Big fan of dancing as well. Uh, not good, by any, but um, and you can't be good at everything. <laughs> um, I'm a good cook, and I think you know I'm, I'm really good at Guitar Hero. Really random one. Uh, <laughs> as far as non climbing skills go, I'm also a really good whistler. Uh, really? But yeah. Okay. No. Nice. puzzles. Honestly, my hobby, my hobbies have like very well prepared me for quarantine. <laughs> You were like, I'm all about being okay. at home. I have to stay home and do a puzzle. That's such a bummer. Like, how terrible. Like, <laughs> and I feel that, this anyway. <laughs> yeah, like the, the sort of the introverts out there, and I'm, I'm in that category myself, are like, um, so I don't have to make excuses to why everyone's going. And I'm like, I kind of feel like staying home. Yeah, exactly. I don't yeah. have to stay home. It's great. But like, yeah, um, as far as I, I want people to know about me, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of an open book. Um, you know, I... I respond to people on Instagram. I think that's a big thing people don't know. Um, I've tried to respond to pretty much every message unless it's like extremely creepy. <laughs> Which unfortunately happens and it, it's sort of mind blowing that it happens, but yeah. yeah I'm pretty lucky. I, I don't get very many of those, but um, you know, it's the internet. Um, yeah. But in general, yeah, I try to respond to everybody who has questions and stuff. So, um, I mean, don't bombard me, but. <laughs> I mean, I mean, don't overestimate the thousands of people that are going to watch this, but um, yeah. you might, you might pick up a few followers of people like, Oh, that's, you know, that's somebody that I want to be, I want to know more about because there's, I follow people who post climbing stuff and then there's, and this is what we're trying to get, you know, and, and it's just to be a little bit different. I want to do these interviews is so that it gives people a reason to say, Oh, wait a minute. I resonate with something different than just a training style or, you know, who my sponsors are or where I like to go climbing. So and I appreciate you being like, you know, super candid about how you got here and, and, and what you're, you know, what you're like and how you get through your day, because that's what makes, um, you know, people that we just see online people, right? That's how we get to know each other is we actually have conversations and we say, Hey, that's interesting. And these are things that I want to know. And so I, I, I absolutely appreciate your time. I, you know, I know that you're, I mean, you're training. I know that we're all at home, but I know that you've got like a schedule and stuff. So I super appreciate it. What sport are you the best at besides climbing? Uh, oh no. Um, that's such a hard one. You don't have to be good at it. You just have to be the best of all the other things you do. I know. I'm trying to think. Um, I am an extremely mediocre soccer player. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, if you had to pick desert or mountains? Uh, mountains. Okay. Um, What's your favorite thing that you cook for yourself? Not for a dinner party or anything, but you're like, I'm gonna go cook something. Favorite thing? Pasta. Pasta with red sauce, but I make the red sauce. Ooh, okay, from scratch. Yeah. Well, from awesome. Scratch. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we, you may have alluded to a few of them, but what's an odd fact about you? Um, odd. Let's see. I clean a lot. <laughs> My house is extremely clean. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you that. Where do you want to go that you have never been? Um, that was hard. I've gotten to go to a lot of the places that I were like on my bucket list. Um, I really want to spend more time in South America in general because I speak Spanish and want to keep practicing it. Awesome. Uh, 
fun fact about me. <laughs> <laughs> just like the, the fun fact list just gets longer and longer and longer. Um, if you had to pick rain or snow. Oh, I hate both, honestly, but uh, I can't do anything fun in the snow because of my back. All fast sports are out of the question. So um, rain probably. Begrudgingly, you're going to pick rain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is something that you are super psyched on right now? Uh, puzzles and knitting. Really psyched on knitting at the moment. Knitting. Yeah. Are you, and this is, I mean, they're not meant to be follow-up questions, but I got to ask, are you like, are you knitting like complex things or are you knitting scarves? I'm knitting a scarf currently. <laughs> it's currently as long as it's going to get. It, it's right now. It's here right now. So, yeah. yeah. You start to realize how like much you want to wrap scarf when you're making it yourself. You're like, one wrap is enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your go-to boredom breaker? Um, boredom breaker, probably television. I love TV. Yeah. Cool. Would you rather be the driver or would you rather be the passenger? Definitely driver. Okay. And I love car, so. <laughs> what song makes you cry every time you hear it? Song. Oh man, I'm not really a song crier. I'm more of a movie crier. Okay. Um, but song. I'll give you movie. I'll give you. I'll give you a pass. Uh, you can have a movie. There's a lot of movies that make me cry, but <laughs> um, probably the Green Mile makes me cry every time. That's a big one. That's a big one. That's 100%. 100%. Um, and then the last one uh, is what profession other than your own would you love to try? Well, I want to be a veterinarian eventually. So, um, you know, my plan after I'm done being a competitive rock climber is to go to vet school. So, yeah, that one. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, which is sort of makes me want to ask a follow up question. So, you're. Uh, Finish school, in school, in between, on hiatus, going to go back? Uh, I finished university, so I have my bachelor's of science um, in animal science and um, took all the pre-med classes so that I can go to vet school. Um, but vet school is another four years, so. So you're going to go competitive climbing and then vet school? That is the plan, at least currently. <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. Do you have pets now? Uh, no, I wish. My uh, apartment complex doesn't allow dogs, and I feel like I travel too much to responsibly own a dog at the moment but I wish I could own a pet right now. So one day there will be pets. Oh yeah, definitely. Great Dane, preferably, but. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Uh, well, Kara, thank you so much for taking the time uh, and I really appreciate it. And I said, you're like open and candid. It was great. Um, we look forward to seeing you compete. Uh, are you gonna compete in the World Cup circuit leading that's up to the Olympics next year? Yeah. So it's a good part of the training schedule. Exactly, yeah, as like, you know, benchmarks and stuff, so. Okay. You're going to come back to Montreal? I hope so. Yeah. Sweet. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye out for you on the World Cup circuit. We will keep an eye out for you in the Olympics. Best of luck in all of those endeavors. And we will keep an eye out for Vet Kyra when it all settles down. Great. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> all right. Uh, stay safe out there. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, you too. See ya.